What's up, my fellow naughty New Year's Nyctophobians? That's a real thing. Check it out. On this very special New Year's edition of the Warp Reality Podcast, we talk about some of the creepiest New Year's traditions from around the world. We learn about a large humanoid amphibian, check in with Chris Whitehouse of the White House Investigation Team, Edgegrave Dave reviews New Year's Evil, and much, much more. So let's get this year started off with a fright. Do aliens exist and are they among us? Are weird creatures lurking in the darkness? Do evil entities hide in the shadows of your bedroom while you sleep? Join us as we explore all this and more on the Warped Reality Podcast. (laughs) Hey, what's going on, everybody? Ghost Joe here, episode 28, the New Year's episode. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed last week's episode, the, uh, the, the holiday episode, excuse me, let me be PC here, the holiday episode, um, that I had with Mr. John Wright, MUFON investigator, paranormal investigator, and just an overall, uh, great guy, great interview. Uh, I definitely want to have him on more. Uh, he had a lot of great insight and I like the fact that he's a skeptic with a lot of things as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the holidays are basically coming to an end right now. Um, you know, we're starting a new year and, uh, this is actually right here, right now. You're getting me off the cuff because I like to, you know, full disclosure, you probably tell, but I actually like to script a lot of my stuff and that's not because, oh, you know, like I don't know what I'm talking about or I don't know. I just like to script things because I feel like if I'm reading something, I'm not going to be using a lot of, uh, ums and trying to remember things that uh, I want to talk about. So, yeah, so this is really the only time you're going to get me without a script is this little portion right here. I hope everybody got what they wanted to for the holidays. Um, Me, I got what I, you know, what I needed. I got some, you know, undershirts and, and socks and stuff. I guess it's what I'm supposed to get as an old 42-year-old guy. Um, but yeah, no, you know, I'm a guitar player too. So if anybody wants to send me a guitar, that'd be cool too. Um, and of course I do this podcasting thing. So anything, yeah, that'd be great. No, actually what I would love from you guys, the listeners would be for you to give me a little bit more interaction. You know, I love, 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 love to hear paranormal experiences and play them on the air. Um, I will never, ever ever judge anybody for their paranormal uh, experiences or opinions because your opinion is your own, you know? And if you say you saw something, then to me, hey, guess what? You saw it, you know? That's just how I am. Uh, But I, uh, yeah, I would love more, you know, interaction from you guys. So if you want to give me a call, 845-600-0744, and let me know your paranormal experiences or just, you know, anything, you know, any kind of horror movie that you'd like us to review. I'm sure uh, Edgegrave Dave would be more than happy to oblige. Um, Yeah, you know, um, so that's that. You know, my, my kids had a great, you know, Christmas and stuff, and everybody's happy and healthy and everything. And... You know, that's that's all we could ask for. I've been on vacation from my crazy, crazy uh, demanding job as the CEO at Rikers Island. Uh, I've been on vacation for the past two and a half weeks. I honestly, I go back in like four days and I'm really, really dreading it. Um, because not only is it taxing mentally, but physically draining as well, because we do so much overtime there. It's just, it's horrible. Uh, but yeah, so I'm really not looking forward to that. Um, my New Year's resolution, of course, is going to be to lose some weight because I always fluctuate, man. Sometimes I start, you know, I, I could, and I could lose weight very quickly when I want to. You know, I've lost 112 pounds in six months before. I've lost 50 pounds in three months before. Um, so I know how to do it when I want to. Um, and I definitely want to start again in January. I know everybody says that, but when I really want to, uh, buckle down and do this, I'm going to do it. So I got to lose, I'd like to lose like, <laughs> like 60 pounds or so, you know, that would be really, really good. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my new year's resolution. The other new year's resolution is I want to start recording more stuff, you know, with, uh, my buddies, uh, Edgegrave Dave and, uh, 
and uh, my buddy Nat, um, you know, just do some original stuff, some cover stuff, you know, just to get the creative juices flowing again. And of course, I want to bring this podcast to the big time, you know, try and get, you know, a lot of, a lot of listeners, more guests, you know, because I love doing the interviews. That's one of my favorite things to do. And yeah, just to give you guys a more uh, entertaining show. So if you guys have any suggestions, please hit me up on that uh, on that number again is 845-600-0744. Or you could email me at ghostjoeny at gmail.com. You can also find me on all of the social media stuff, Facebook, uh, TikTok, um, you know, Instagram. All that stuff is usually the Ghost Joe or, uh, or the Warp Reality Podcast. So please look into that. Check that out. I would love it. It's always in the show notes as well. So please check that out. So let's get this thing started now. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is this list that I have found on mentalfloss.com. And it's, it's entitled Odd Lang Sign, the seven creepy New Year's superstitions that'll keep you up past midnight. So, you know, like I said, I found this list, mental health, mentalfloss.com. <laughs> And I thought it was quite interesting. So let's let's get into it, shall we? So number one of the list is to use bread to scare away problematic spirits. Um, an old Irish New Year's Eve tradition uh, would have residents banging loaves of bread on their doors and walls just before the New Year's. Uh, it's said to keep angry apparitions and bad luck away and to ensure your family won't go hungry for the next 12 months. You know, unless, unless of course, the only food you had was the loaf of bread that you're using to bang on the walls and door. Uh, number two is kind of a familiar one. Uh, this one is also an Irish tradition, and it's to leave your doors unlocked and leave a setting at the table for any loved ones who had passed that year, uh, in essence, to welcome them back. So number three is for anyone that does their laundry on a daily basis. See, skip doing it on New Year's Day. As this tradition suggests, if you do your laundry on New Year's Day, you are washing for the dead. And someone from your family will most likely die that year. It also means that if you do, you will have more laundry than ever for the coming year. So no laundry on New Year's Day. So number four kind of piggybacks off of number three in this Victorian era tradition. And it states that if you get rid of anything, garbage, food, property, anything on January 1st, you will be setting the scene for people and things to leave you in the coming year. You know what? You know, you know what? Let's, let's just just don't do any cleaning or chores on New Year's Day. Just just don't do anything. All right, you're probably going to be a little bit uh, hungover anyway, so screw it. Just, you know, just hang out. Just sleep the whole day. Why not? Number five is to burn any kind of propaganda, clothing or anything from pop culture or anything that's been in the news, people in the news, or politicians from the past year. Um, it dates all the way back to 1895 in an Ecuadorian tradition. All right, so number six is one most of us actually do, uh, just with a slight variation. Hailing from the tradition in the Philippines, and it's to get absolutely wasted, to forget about the... Pre no, no, wait, no, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. That's, that's not right. It's to make a lot of noise, uh, only it's... To keep all doors and windows open while doing so to get rid of all the evil and negative energy from the previous year or from from that year that's leaving us and number seven is a tradition from japan that involves people dressing up like demons and they go door to door scaring lazy people I guess it's the same lazy people that refuse to do their laundry and throw out their garbage uh, oh also the people that go door to door threatening to take, they also threaten to take misbehaving children, but they will be appeased with some sake and rice cakes. You know what? I, I, I don't know about the rice cakes, but I'd, I'd be appeased with some sake as well. Uh, so, you know, there you have it. The seven creepiest New Year's traditions from around the world 
as told by mentalfloss.com. Which ones are you guys going to do? Let me know. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for some I read it on Reddit. And this one's entitled The New Year's Eve Shapeshifter. And it's by Blue Vosh. Okay. So this story happened in the New Year's Eve of 2010. I'm visiting my friends in our city before me and my family starts our New Year's Eve celebration. When suddenly I receive a phone call from my uncle. My uncle asked me if I can visit them before our New Year's Eve celebration starts. My uncle lives in the countryside of my city. I said yes, and I asked my friend if she could come along with me. My friend said yes, so we traveled outside of our city around 9.30 p.m. in my motorbike. We arrived at my uncle's house at 10 p.m. My uncle is very happy. We talk, we eat and drink, but I don't drink that much because I'm going to drive back home. Me and my friend spend a good amount of time then there when I notice that it's already 11.30 p.m. So we just got 30 minutes to go back to our city. So we tell my uncle that we are going home and we start traveling back home. But we just got 30 minutes before the New Year's Eve starts. This, uh, I should have proofread this. So me and my friend decided to change route. I knew a shortcut road in that area but we have to travel past the rice field. I know that road, but I don't travel there at night because it's so sketchy and he's scared. There's no houses near that area, but me and my friend don't have a choice that time. So we choose that shortcut road. When we're traveling that stretch of road, I noticed that my friend looked in the middle of the rice field and starts shaking. So I asked my friend, what happened? And she answered in a trembling voice, What's that thing in the middle of the rice field? I was driving that time and the road is rocky, so I just looked for a second in the middle of the rice field and I saw something, but my brain can't make it out. What I see, what I see so answered my friend, it looks like a walking tree. Then I start to question myself, a moving tree? Because that thing is moving. It looks like it's moving. So I stop my motorbike to take a closer look at that thing or whatever it is. And then I was shocked, scared and trembling in fear. When I looked in the middle of the rice field, I saw a big horse, tall as a tree, but this horse is not walking on four legs. It's walking on two legs and with hands like a human. The creature is looking in the sky in the direction of the fireworks. So I start my motorbike and just hit the gas on it. My friend is screaming and I'm so scared. While we were getting out of that place, when me and my friend were near our city a strong gust of wind hit us we almost fell to the ground then my motorbike stopped working i tried to start it a couple of times but it's not starting we're in our city so we decided to leave my motorbike at the auto repair shop because it's new year's eve no one is there to repair my motorbike so we went home that night in the morning i came back to the auto repair shop for my motorbike but the mechanic asked me what happened to it and i answered why What's the problem with the bike? The mechanic told me that I need to pay a large amount of money to repair it uh, because it was hit by lightning. He told me that all of my motorbike's electrical parts were burned and needed to be replaced. And he showed me all of it. And again, I felt scared because he and my friend were sitting on that motorbike the time it stopped. There is no way it was hit by lightning. Until that day... I could not explain what I saw and what happened to my bike that night. But whatever it is, one thing is for sure. The thing that I saw in that rice field that New Year's Eve was definitely not human. So, I don't know. What what do you guys think that was? You know, the thing is, you know, you're, you're driving on a very dark stretch of road with you know, these rice fields and it's, it's super dark and, and you can't really see, you know, even pretty much even in front of you that well. And when you glance over to the right or to the left, you know, at at a high rate of speed, things may look like they're moving when in fact they're not. Uh, But this person is swearing that they saw Whatever it was standing on, you know, very, very, very tall, standing on two legs. 
Um, what do you guys think that could have been? Do you think that was some weird cryptid that we don't know about? And do you think uh, the person might have had a little bit more to drink than than they thought they did? Um, I certainly think that they might have had a little bit more to drink than they thought they did when they wrote the uh, when they wrote when they wrote the Reddit because it was uh, <laughs> not very easy to read. But yeah, um, so there you have it. I read it on Reddit, New Year's edition. All right, everyone. So enough about me and talking and stuff. Uh, so right now we're going to check in with Chris Whitehouse of the White House investigation team. He's going to tell us a little bit about a, an investigation that he had done. And he shares some evidence with us that is on his YouTube channel as well, the White House Investigations YouTube channel. So check this out. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing evidence and uh, it's uh, quite a story. So take it away, Chris. Well, today I'm going to share a story from a place we call the Doggy Daycare. It's where dogs are looked after in a playful environment while their owners go away on holiday. Well, we're in this building that used to be a munitions factory making grenades. On this occasion, on this evening, we were talking to a more modern spirit called Jordan, who had called to the board to say hi. And after a lovely little conversation with Jordan, we took a pause and said, look, can you make a noise in this room? And we always get little ticks in the cooling of building that you kind of dismiss. But surprisingly, we got a real loud bang on the shutter just at that time. Behind that shutter is an enclosed yard of about 10 foot square. And so I knew there was nobody there. And yes, just a bang on the shutter. Now, interestingly, my dictaphone that I used to record sound separately to cameras had suddenly stopped recording, I noticed afterwards. And yet, picking it up, I found the, back tr- the batteries were totally fine and there was no real reason why the sound would have stopped. Luckily, I had at least three other cameras recording, so the audio you hear on my video is the edits jumping from camera to camera, and I also replay the sound. But it's made us jump, and I would like to present you that evidence. I hope you enjoy it. Make a noise for us, or make a meter go off. That'd be amazing. Woo! That'd be a nice walk. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Jordan. That is the first time I've <laughs> ever heard a noise in a response. Yeah. I mean, there hasn't been any other... My heart is racing. ...in the past since we began, any clicks of from that, there. That was a proper push or yes. deliberate. It was a loud noise when we asked her. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, that is amazing. You. If you want to witness any of our videos and evidence, it is our, on our YouTube page. White House Investigations. Yeah, so I had actually heard that uh, a while back on his YouTube, and it definitely uh, is definitely pretty amazing, man. And I I love the fact, and I got to give them props, because I I love the fact that they're very calm, cool, collected, and very respectful at the same time of, uh, you know, everything that's going on. You know, you you don't really see that too much on on these YouTube and, uh, you know, TV shows, of course. Uh, but yeah, I, I love that episode and he has way more compelling evidence as well on his YouTube channel, White House Investigations. And he also does interviews uh, on his other YouTube channel called Talking Paranormal. So check that out. And he also has a book out on Amazon and it's only $8. So just go and buy it. It's an awesome read. It's called Into the Darkness, Becoming a Ghost Hunter. And his name is Chris Whitehouse. So please check it out and let me know what you think. You know, 845-600-0744. All right, everybody. So now let's get into some haunted eBay. So the first item that I'd like to bring to your attention, uh, this one is kind of a long description, but quite, uh, quite interesting. So this one is entitled Haunted Paranormal 20-Inch Creepy Faceless Ragdoll, and it's aggressive, so please read. And you can buy it for $15.99, and the shipping is $10.50, uh, located in Wilkes Bar, Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. So this one is 
Haunted Paranormal 20-inch Creepy Faceless Ragdoll. We purchased this item online uh, on an online auction from Wyoming. Although listed as haunted, there was no description on what she was capable of or the experiences that the owners had had. They also weren't sure of her age, but only were able to disclose that they had purchased her from an estate sale locally. Apparently, the woman who passed was not a very friendly neighbor. Nobody really knew her, but everyone was curious enough to go into her home to see what was for sale. They bought her, they bought her, had a terrible few weeks without getting into details, and were insistent that they believed it was their miserable neighbor who attached herself to the doll. Every question we asked about what the activity was went unanswered. So why would you why would you take it? Anyway, when we received her, we let her adjust to our home for a few days. Over the first evening, our dogs kept whimpering and walking through the dining room with their tails between their legs. They would not lift their heads to be able to see her. The atmosphere around her seemed to be heavy and hard to breathe. As we watched TV in the other room, we heard a loud bang from the dining room, and we went and when we went in, one of our dining room chairs was knocked over and a picture frame uh, on the side table was knocked over into another. The dogs had been laying by our feet, so we couldn't blame them. We picked them up and after about 10 minutes, we heard it again, only louder. This time, we found a chair tipped over again into another and our four picture frames on the table all knocked over into each other. We left our pictures laying down to prevent their breakage and told her no more. During, the, during that night, our daughter experienced nightmares, waking her up several times. Her room seemed heavy and she had felt a presence in her room. When we went down, everything was in place except for her, the doll meeting. She was now laying on a chair, somehow moving herself from the center of our table. When we started communicating with her, our equipment immediately spiked up. Uh, so these are ghost hunters, apparently. We could feel the energy in the room thicken. We asked her to please relax and light our K2 up. It's a K2 meter, not, not, the, not the illegal drug. Uh, up, to re- up to the red to let us know. I, I don't think so, at least. To let us know if she was with us. She answered by turning it red. We asked her to turn the, the REM pod light to blue. She turned it on, but turned it to green. Through the night, our K2 meter kept bouncing between the second green light and red. Our REM pod kept lighting up blue and green, and the MEL meter fluctuated from 0.9 to 2.1. I don't know what any of this means. I, I don't know why they would put this in there. Uh, with a temperature drop of 6 degrees. We didn't get many responses through the spirit box, except for answering here dark when we asked if she liked coming to our home. When we asked her if she moved our things, we heard a sinister laugh come through. As we started to mention the dogs, it said heard them. She hadn't yet, so we asked if she planned to. Did she not like them? She answered will. We assume meaning she will hurt them. As we continued to communicate, a candle fell off the side table, which did almost hit our one dog. We told her she was done in our home. She was not welcome, and we will not let her hurt anyone. And as we expressed our dislike of her behavior, our REM pod and K2 both immediately shut off. Through our night vision screen, as we started to shut it off, What looked like a black mass seemed to block out of the screen. Couldn't see anything and then just disappeared. We quickly turned lights on, equipment off, and removed her to our finished shed. Cleansed our home and got rid of all the negative energy. We never got an answer from her if she was good or evil, but her actions had ill intent. We believe she would have hurt our dogs and maybe the cats if she could. So we would not take any chances, and she has stayed outside. 
Possibly she didn't like being taken from her original home with maybe she doesn't like us and wants to be in a quieter home. But we only tried two more. Well, maybe you shouldn't be smoking so much K2. Tried two more times to communicate and got the same response from her negativity. Please note, as some have questioned the spirit not interacting with them in items they have purchased from other sellers, spirits have their own personalities. Sometimes it does take them a day or two or even longer to adjust their new surroundings. Most likely this, well, this is coming from me. Most likely these things probably won't happen or, you know, uh, it, it probably takes at least, you know, a day after, you know, you're, you're no longer able to return the items anymore. That's when, you know, that's how long it would probably take. Uh, it is their right to do so. They do not perform on command. They should be treated with the respect that they deserve and patience because in some cases it was not their choice or preference to stay among us. I do start my bidding at just above the cost of what I paid for my items as to cover the cost of the selling. I don't believe in hiking them up. The bidding is your decision and rehoming the items is my goal. If for some reason payment can't be made within the first three days, please contact me to let me know. Otherwise, I assume you have changed your mind and I will relist the item. Our family has been doing paranormal investigations for 14 years from Eastern State Penitentiary, uh, White Hill Mansion in New Jersey, Salem, Massachusetts, Penhurst Asylum, Gettysburg, PA, plus many more locations. We've collected many haunted items over the past 10 years, and at this point, although I personally feel an attachment to them, we need to make room for some of our newer acquisitions. All right, so our second and final item is the haunted frog playing a saxophone. Okay. Um, it's going for $50. It's a little statue, by the way. It's not an actual frog playing a saxophone. Otherwise, I'd probably pay probably a little bit more than $50 for something like that. Anyway, uh, it reminds me of that Looney Tunes guy. Uh, anyway, so it's uh, it goes for $50, and it's $9 shipping in Providence, Rhode Island. So, haunted frog playing a saxophone. A box of old antiques from my old roommate's ex was left out at, at our house. She said that she, her grandmother had told her that all of the items were haunted. She has long passed, but I no longer want to have ghosts in my house. So I am, I am going to start selling these items off. The ghost activity has been fairly harmless, but scares friends and roommates. We have heard footsteps when no one else is home. Items on shelves fall off or are or moved. You can hear people talking near the box of items in the basement when no one else is down there. And also, you hear a vaudeville singer saying, Hello, my baby. Hello. My no, no, no. That's, that's, that's not true. Our cat loves exploring the basement, but will not go near the box either. This frog playing a saxophone is very odd and kind of terrifying. If you are into collecting haunted items, this thing will bring the weird. All right, guys, and that'll do it for this segment of Haunted eBay. And uh, yeah, remember, I make no promises and I have, you know, I hold no responsibility if you buy any of these items and you do or do not get any paranormal activity out of them, uh, this is just an entertainment, an entertaining segment uh, for you guys to listen to. But they are really listed on eBay. So if you did want to bid on them, go ahead and do so. If you have any uh, paranormal experiences while doing so, if you get any of these items, Please let me know. 845 600 0744. Right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So now we are going to check in with Edgegrave Dave on his horrible review of New Year's Evil. Let's get it, Edgegrave. Horrible review of Edgegrave Dave. Happy New Year's Evil, Grave Diggers, or should I say, New Year's Evil? And the reason why we are saying that is we are going to be discussing 1980s horror film, New Year's Evil, directed by Emmett Alston, starring 
Grant Kramer with Roz Kelly and Kip Niven. And by the way, Grant Kramer is the great grandson of famous inventor of the Industrial Revolution, Stuart W. Kramer. He actually coined the term air conditioning. See, there you go. You kind of learn a little bit here with Edgegrave Dave. And Roz Kelly did play Fonzie's girlfriend, Pinky, from Happy Days. So there you go. A couple of little facts for you. So this was a time in horror where slasher films were well underway. You know, you had a lot of holiday-themed movies at this point where it almost started to feel a little bit generic. You did have 1974's Black Christmas, 1978's Halloween, and Friday the 13th did come out in 1980. So by this point, it seems like they were sort of trying to stick with a certain theme, and they were kind of churning out some of these movies. But this film is a little bit different. You know, I got to tell you, one of the uh, backdrops of this is that there is actually 80s new wave going on. There's a lot of rock music some punk rock. You can see where metal's kind of coming in. I mean, the first half of the movie will really have you pumping. There are two bands. There's a band named Shadow and Made in Japan, and it just rocks the whole way through. You know, I've probably never seen so much, like, glam makeup in in a horror movie before. At part of the time, I thought I was looking at maybe Twisted Sister. Uh, Other times, I thought I was maybe looking at something like uh, Spinal Tap. And a lot of of the cutscenes back and forth really show that. You also have gangs, you have punks, you have motorcyclists, all kinds of things going on. And the crowd, I mean, if you want to see what sort of a... anti-disco was kind of going on back then see this movie i mean they're really swaying like a bunch of zombies it's really one of the funniest things that i've probably ever seen in a horror film at this time i am going to issue an edge grave warning spoiler alert now the substance of this film is where things do fall just a little bit short but i do love the 80s charm to this movie i sort of find a strange comfort in it if you will the main motive of the killer is that he has to kill in all different time zones at the stroke of midnight on New Year's Eve. And the way that he does this is he actually tape records. Yes, with tape, he records his murders. And he calls into a show called Hollywood Hotline at the dance club where they're, you know, playing all that new wave and everything like we just mentioned. And he uses this voice. I'm going to create murder at midnight. Now, I sort of like Kevin McAllister's uh, voice changer a little bit better in Home Alone, but I guess that they didn't have that technology yet. And he's coming for Diane, who happens to be the first lady of rock. See, it's all over this movie, guys. And as he's inching closer, he's killing females, preferably blonde girls. And his motive (laughs) is a terrible one. As he clearly states, ladies are not nice people. They're manipulative, deceitful, immoral, and selfish creatures, okay? So, guys, we're going into 2023. We just got to treat people better within our horror. Now, all while this is happening, the murders aren't all that bloody, but there are certainly some interesting ones. And you later find out that the killer is somehow connected. I'm not going to tell you how. He is connected to Diane, the first lady of rock, in some way. And there's something very strange going on with their son, which I did sort of feel that they kind of added that in. In in a way, almost wasn't really necessary, but it does lead to the climax, which, again, um, sort of not the ending that I would have chosen, but you sort of have this sort of... uh, paint by numbers horror film where you know maybe they borrowed some ideas from all different things that were going on in the genre but it's definitely worth seeing now the name of the show is called the hollywood hotline this does take place in the la area so all the different time zones that's actually pretty cool you know you get to see new york i believe they, that you get to see uh colorado and you know all while this is happening what's pretty cool is you can sort of see how new year's eve was brought Broadcasted back in the day, and you know, as a uh, you know student of culture here, I did find that very interesting. Um, this movie, upon its release, wasn't actually shown again until the until the early two thousands, when Quentin Tarantino's new Beverly Cinema 
actually played it. I guess that he was a big fan of this movie, you know, as it is a uh, sort of a cultural icon. Um, Shout Factory did do a pretty cool release of this movie as well, and many, many other hard gems from back then. So, you know, it's great to see that a lot of these things came back. And it is, while it's going to be leaving, it is currently on um, Amazon Prime. So maybe not at this time of this recording, but you can totally find it. New Year's Evil, 1980. And it was also filmed very quick. This was shot in October, and it came out in December. So, you know, the holidays were certainly around, and, you know, I'm sure this was a very different kind of movie for people to come and see at that time. So I do sort of rate this a two out of maybe three graves. You know, some people might find a lot of things that they like about it more than others. But, um, you know, while it's certainly not groundbreaking, it is it is certainly something to see. And, and that whole culture there, like I said, you know, it's just kind of great to kind of time travel and go back and see something like this. So happy New Year's evil. And guys, have a great 2023. I hope it's very horror, Phil. Now back to you, Ghost Joe. So thank you very much, Edge Grave, for that horrible review. And thank you for always coming through and getting me some great uh, reviews there. And I hope we could do this for a lot longer and have a happy, uh, I was almost going to say happy Thanksgiving, but I know we already passed that already. So yeah, you know, have a happy new year and I uh, can't wait to see what the 2023 brings for us here at the uh, Warped Reality Podcast. All right, everybody. So now we're going to take a trip to the Cryptid Zoo, shall we? Today, we're going to talk about the Loveland Frogman. Out in Loveland, Ohio, there is a local legend of a humanoid frogman being spotted. Witnesses describe it as being about four feet tall, walking on its hind legs with frog-like features and leathery skin. Shit sounds like my ex-girlfriend. A- anyway, the first reported sighting was by a traveling salesman in 1955 in the month of May. He claims that while driving on a desolate road late at night, heading out of Branch Hill neighborhood, he spotted three frog humanoids standing on hind legs alongside of the road. One of the frog people came up to his window and said, Hey, buddy, what's your pleasure? No, 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 that, that's, that last part didn't actually happen. Uh, another version of the story, though, um, puts him seeing these creatures under a bridge while one of them held a sparkling wand over their heads. So apparently they're wizards. Anyway, on March 3rd, 1972, at 1 a.m., Loveland police officer Ray Shockey was driving on Riverside Drive near the Totes Boot Factory and the Little Miami River when an unidentified animal scurried across the road in front of his vehicle. The animal was fully illuminated in his vehicle's headlights, and he described it as being three to four feet long and about 50 to 75 pounds with leathery skin. He reported spotting the animal crouching like a frog before it momentarily stood erect to climb over the guardrail and back down towards the river. Two weeks after the incident, a second Loveland police officer, Mark Matthews, reported seeing an unidentified animal sighting. Matthews shot the animal, recovered the body, and put it in his trunk to show Officer Shockey. According to Matthews, it was a large iguana, about three to three and a half feet, and he didn't immediately recognize it because it was missing its tail. Matthews speculated the iguana had been someone's pet that either got loose or was released when it grew too large. According to Matthews, Shockey was shown the dead iguana and confirmed it was the animal he had seen two weeks previously. So this iguana apparently also knew how to stand on its hind legs and walk over a guardrail. Anyway, Matthews recounted the incident to an author of a book about urban legends, and uh, but the author omitted the part that confirmed that the creature was an iguana rather than a frogman. In August 2016, a local Cincinnati TV station reported that a night of fun turned into a chilling tale of horror when two teenagers playing Pokemon Go between Loveland Madeira Road and Lake Isabella claim to see a giant frog near the lake on August 3rd that stood up and walked on its hind legs. It was later revealed to be a local student from Archbishop Moeller High School in a homemade frog costume. So what do you guys what do you guys think? 
Do you believe the police officer's statements that it was just an iguana? Or do you think they were told to say that in order to not be ridiculed? Do you believe in the Frogman? Have you ever seen the Frogman? Give me a call, 845-600-0744. Email me at ghostjoeny at gmail.com and let me know about it. Anyway, before we close out, I did want to thank a bunch of people for helping me throughout everything. So, of course, thank you to you guys, the listeners, for continuing to listen to the podcast and giving me the motivation to keep going. Uh, every time I see those numbers, you know, uh, I, I get happy that there's people that actually want to listen to me and listen to my craziness every other week. So, but first off, um, I, I would like to thank uh, Chris Whitehouse of the White House investigation team. Chris had come on board when I was about to give up and he continues to deliver amazing content, motivation, and advice for me uh, a lot, all right? Uh, by the way, Chris, uh, again, has that awesome book out, Into the Darkness, Becoming Ghost Hunter. So please support his journey and get your copy on Amazon. Uh, thank you to my longtime partner in crime, Edgegrave Dave. I couldn't ask for a better horror reviewer than you. Uh, you bring life and entertainment to the segment. And I think we'll always be linked somehow, uh, no matter how far away we live from each other. To my very talented artistic friend, Steve, thank you for putting up with my shenanigans and always coming up with great artwork content for the show. You're amazing. Uh, thank you to another longtime best friend and super fan of the podcast from the beginning, my buddy Nat. Uh, thank you for always listening, bro. Uh, by the way, Nat has contributed some tiny, terrifying tales to the podcast, which I promise I will get around to soon. And I'm going to have that up there as well. Uh, thank you to my podcast friends, uh, Bill Van Vagel from the Phantom Galaxy podcast and Land of the Creeps podcast uh, for all of your encouragement and you know helping me from since the beginning. Uh, thank you to Albie Robles from the Scare Me podcast. Uh, Kat Ward from the Paranormal Hearts podcast, Chappie from the Not Normal and Paranormal Stories and Spooky Shiz podcast, uh, Eve S. Evans for all the help you've given me from day one. She's got a ton of books out, um, fiction and nonfiction, so please check her out as well. She's awesome. She has podcasts as well. Um, Jay Wiley of Clubhouse and the Law Enforcement Today podcast, thank you for all of your input, and I hope to work with you soon. And of course, Troubles Garcia and Big Tank of the Paranoia Radio podcast and all of my guests that I've interviewed in the last two years. If I've forgotten anyone, I'm very, very sorry. It's kind of late as I'm recording this. So as this show is ending, a new year is beginning. And with that, more creepy stories, haunted eBay, interviews and more. Uh, next week, I'll be releasing my bonus segment from the Paranoia Radio podcast and the week after is Friday the 13th special. So stay tuned and keep listening. And I will keep making content for you guys. Uh, please share uh, the podcast if you like it and you want to help me out. Please share it with some family members and some friends uh, that you think might like this sort of thing. You know, again, I do take the subject matter seriously. I just don't take myself too seriously because, you know, my, my job is serious enough. You know what I'm saying? So... I like to, you know, let loose and be silly every, every once in a while. So, yeah, have a great new year and don't do anything I wouldn't do, you know. But, uh, yeah, happy new year, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Warp Reality Podcast. And thank you to all my guests and contributors that helped make this show possible. For more episodes, guest info, social media links, merch, and more, please check out WarpRealityPodcast.com. If you have a paranormal experience you would like to share, questions, comments, or you'd like to be a guest on the show, please leave me a voicemail at 845-600-0744, or you can email me at ghostjoeny at gmail.com. You can do so anonymously if you'd like. Also, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or WolfRealityPodcast.com. Have a great night, everyone, and don't forget to change your shorts.